Uh, this is very exciting to be here uh, for a couple of reasons. It's actually, I'm actually very nervous, and the reason I'm very nervous is goes back to about 2012, if you'll just indulge me with a quick story. When I first started working with the Philippines um, at ANZ, I had to hire a team. I had to, had to build a client, client contact centre team. And it was actually the first uh, outsourced voice or first outsourced vo client contact centre that ANZ did. It was done very successfully. The team still exists. It's much bigger. Fantastic people. Um, and th the first time uh, I did a job interview as a hiring manager, I sat down across the table and uh, is anyone in here Australian or from New Zealand? Okay, just one. So forgive me for what I'm going to say because uh, I'm going to speak quite freely here. Australians typically have a very healthy distrust of authority and of management. And so if you sit across the table from an Australian, they're generally going to be squinting at you, looking at you, going, who are you? What do you know? I know more than you. And I went into this job interview expecting that, expecting that I kind of had to prove myself. And so I had the, the traditional set questions of, tell me three challenges that you've had and where do you want to be in three years and all this type of thing. And I sat down with this first candidate, Vic was his name, I'll never forget that. And I said, oh, tell me about a uh, challenge you've had in your career. 35 minutes later, he had told me the most incredible story. And every single job interview since then that I've had in Manila or in the Philippines, I get these amazing stories. And Magellan, we just saw another incredible story. So I'm very nervous to be here because I know how high the bar is set for presentation skills and storytelling in the Philippines. It's uh, world class. So forgive me if I don't quite meet, meet the mark, but I am trying. Um, I work for a firm called Delta Capita. Delta Capita is a financial services consulting firm. We are predominantly deployed across banks, insurers, and asset managers globally. Uh, founded in London, uh, and recently in the last 12 months, we've undergone a lot of investment and expansion in Asia, based out of Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, and with increasing amounts of travel here to Manila, because we firmly, firmly believe uh, in the future of not just the fintech space, but the financial services landscape in this region. Um, I've been asked to talk, I think the title of uh, the Australians just left the room, so I really must have insulted him. I'll have to find him and apologise later. Uh, I, I've been asked to talk about fintech and banking, and I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about fintech because I'm not a developer, I'm not a technologist myself. Um, but I'm a banker, I'm a career banker, and I've seen what's starting to happen, what started to happen six, seven years ago, and what's really started to take off in the last two years. And that is the cultural threat that is taking place within our banks. Um, fintech, the word, uh, define it. Uh, Everywhere you see fintech, it's written differently. Block letters, little letters, little letters, big T, because it's all about the tech, not the fin. Um, essentially, for me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an optimistic person, but I'm also a pretty big skeptic. Fintech, we've started talking about in the last three, four, five years. But for me, fintech actually started with the wheel. The product was always there. It was the way the product gets distributed that's changing. Fintech is not some th sort of thing that is owned by Gen Y millennials and digital disruptors. It's not grown in garages on a shoestring budget. Fintech is absolutely everywhere and it has been everywhere since earlier than we can ever know. And it's about the way a product gets distributed, a financial product or a transaction, or as we heard Magellan's story with um, receivable finance. And it's by no means limited to banks and financial services firms. I'm not a huge fan of PowerPoint, so I'm just going to talk to you. There's not videos and, and flying graphics, so uh, bear with me. Um, when we go into our banks, when we go into our partner banks, we ask them a few questions. We, we, we tend to try and get an idea of, of what people think. In, and what we, what we say to the banks is, in your opinion, what do you feel will be your most successful strategy? when we're talking about the challenge uh, of fintech? Would it be to partner with, to invest in, to compete with, to acquire, or do you just not know? Of course, there's no right answer, but it might interest you. When we present this to a room, and we did this about a month ago, when we present this to a room 
of bankers from a, a specific European bank, 70% came back with partner. We want a partner. Okay, that sounds logical. But let's actually think about what that means. You want a partner. Okay, you're a huge bank with 20, 30, 50, 100,000 staff. You want a partner with a fintech, and that's the answer. Which one? Why? How? Where? How do, you, how do you make that choice? So partner sounds good, but is it actually the right choice? And do you have the culture within your institution right now to be able to successfully partner with a firm, say, like Magellan's, which is run by a passionate, committed subject matter expert with a staff of 20 to 30, and you're going to drop that infrastructure into a culture of a technology department of 20, 30,000 people. How's that going to go? We ask our banks, and thankfully, majority answer this the way they should. Regardless of where we are, what should we be? What should we be? When I started in banking in 2003, um, who has worked, I'm, I'm sure, who has worked for a bank or with banks in their career? Just show our hands. So there's a healthy, healthy chunk here. And we all have bank accounts, fortunately or unfortunately. Um, are we a bank, are we as a bank, a financial service product provider that needs an IT department? Or are we a technology company that distributes a financial services product. I can absolutely say 14, 15, probably five or six years ago, number one was the answer that most people would come back with. I can tell you that thankfully that has changed. Banks now recognise that they are technology companies distributing financial services product. Whether they're equipped to do it, whether they're doing it successfully, they do recognise that the competition has changed. They are now competing with people that they were not competing with 10 years ago. 10 years ago, IBM were falling over themselves to service banks to sell them things. Now, IBM, IBM Watson, what is being developed in their labs, some of their stock, uh, predictive stock analytic tools, they are going to compete. And the third question, which I pers my personal belief, this is the most important part. What's your biggest blocker to success? Is it your size? Is it the entrenched culture? Is it the skills that you've got within your organisation? Is it the leadership? Or is it regulation? What's the biggest blocker? Again, the majority come back with, thankfully, what I think is the biggest challenge to banking right now, and this is all about entrenched culture that's difficult to change. Banks have incredible human capital, very, very talented, committed people who want things to improve, they want things to be done better, absolutely. But the culture that has been allowed or able to develop over many, many years is one that creates silos there's a compliance department, an operations department, a legal department, a sales department, a trading department. And yes, they all collaborate and work together. But ultimately, when we're talking about change and the speed of change that is required to keep up, let alone get ahead in this market, those kinds of silos slow you down and actually can stop innovation. Fintechs are booming in volume. We, we don't need to do that. You just need to Google the word fintech and bang, you're going to have a list of too many firms for you ever to be able to actually assess. Many are focused, and again, I'm, I'm going to refer back to Magellan's um, presentation. Classic case. A singular, specific problem that he's a deep subject matter expert in, and he builds a business around that with laser focus on that problem or that challenge or that opportunity, whatever you want to call it. And he's solving it in an API environment in a manner that delights the customer. The focus is on delighting the customer. Not just 
having something out there that makes revenue, but let's, let's solve something, let's make it better, let's improve it, and let's delight our customer. Potentially, fintechs themselves in isolation, they, they won't have the scale to compete with a bank per se. They'll have the 20 to 30 really skilled, talented people, but they go against a, you know, a behemoth with jurisdictions of 150, 20,000 people in a trade and receivables department. So he's not going to have the same reach, but what he does have is he's got a specific solution that has been developed with singular focus. So in isolation, one fintech is no threat to a bank. A good friend of mine says it's not, it's not having one beer that's the problem. It's when those beers gang up on you, that's when you get in trouble. And it's the same thing with fintech and banks. It's not the one great idea that's challenging the banks. It's the fact that we heard from Jishnu, these, these large tech companies, you could build, you, could, you and your team of developers, you could build a bank in a very quick amount of time for not much money. It's just that you probably realise that there's not the uh, business case to do it, but you could do it. Banks are being caught in a pincer move between the huge technology conglomerates and the fintechs. So let's look at the threat, and I want to visualise the threat. It's not about the one fintech. This is the landing page for Wells Fargo. Um, in the US. I know the graphics are too hard to read, so apologies for that. But you get the gist. On each of these landing page, on each of these tabs on the landing page, we have payments, for example. And what this does is it lists out the current payment providers in the market that are threatening just Wells Fargo. This is just one bank, a big bank, mind you. And you see that visual. Look at all these names. They are all threatening different parts of that bank's hard-won, long-standing client base, revenue base, profit base. Now, out of all those names, when I first looked at this, the only, I only knew two names, Square, uh, Jack Dorsey's uh, payment platform, and Acorns, uh, the, uh, the, wealth, uh, the wealth advisory or wealth tech startup. The rest of these are names that many of these will be three or four person founded firms. They are threatening. If we did this exercise across all the banks in the Philippines, you would find the exact same, you would find the exact same output. These exa existing financial services firms rely, banks rely on diversified income, diversified profit for liquidity, for everything that they do. But if they're under attack on all fronts from multiple challenges, how do you actually cope? How do you succeed under that pressure? Is the answer partnering? You're going to go into partnership with all of these fintechs? In 13, we saw uh, venture capital and investment, and we know that the amount of deal flow into fintech is not just booming in units, but in size of deals. The Ant Financial deal being done last year, one of the largest. Um, it's continuing to trend up, and while deal volume was off, according to PitchBook, in 2015 to 2016, the actual size of the deals being done. So we know that there's a lot of fintechs, but we also now know that they're being funded better than ever before. So the, the, it's not as though the fintechs are coming. The fintechs are here. What's changing is they're getting better and better funded. Is it translating into a true threat? Okay, so lots of great ideas, lots of great businesses, lots of really, you know, fantastic stories out there. Uh, is the actual market share being lost? We know that last year, uh, December last year, Facebook acquired an e-money uh, license in Ireland. So what are they doing with that? Sitting on it? We know that they've applied for banking licenses in the United States. Facebook, I think they've put in 51 banking license applications. What are they doing with that? 
sitting on it? No, they're coming. Something is coming. Now, the reason it is coming, Accenture did a survey at the end of last year, about 30,000 30, people across a number of different markets, Indonesia, Italy, uh, Ireland as well. 31% of those people surveyed, and it wasn't just 21-year-olds, it was a broad, as Accenture do great work, it was a broad cross-section, offered the question, if Facebook, Google or Amazon offered you a transaction banking account now, would you switch? 31% straight away, yep. Imagine what that would do to a bank. 31% of your customer base saying, bye-bye. I'm going because this is more integrated. More integrated with my life. It delights me. So we've got a mix of a huge threat in volume, better funded, and now not just the small fintechs operating out of a garage, but Facebook, Google, Amazon, and the large tech firms. Here's a quick stat from Bloomberg. It, in traditional markets, it's already happened. 72% of mortgages originated in the United States are originated now through companies like Quicken Loans. They're, they're not written by BAML or uh, Wells Fargo. 72% are coming through non-bank lenders and originators. This doesn't mean the bank is disappearing from that transaction. The bank is still funding, and one of the terms, one of my partners, uh, Trevor, who I've borrowed a lot of this material from, uses is banks are becoming headless. And what headless means is you don't sign with the bank anymore. The bank is there in the liquidity stage, the syndication stage, they're funding things, and there will always be that place for the bank, but they're not out the front in front of the customer. This has already happened in a traditional mortgage market in the United States. I'll tell another quick story, and for those of you who are interested in following or have followed foreign exchange, the dominant and best foreign exchange platform in the world used to be something called Autobahn. Autobahn was built by Deutsche Bank. It was incredible. Through the, I think, the 90s and the early 2000s, corporate and institutional customers would have an Autobahn login. They'd log into Deutsche Bank's proprietary foreign exchange system. It did everything, hedging, spot, forwards, fantastic system, integrated into the Deutsche Bank back office, your confirmations, your settlements, the entire deal flow. It created enormous liquidity for Deutsche Bank, uh, for their traders. Sounds great. It now loses money because managing your own website, end-to-end, -end, process, platform, etc., in a banking environment, when everyone, every corporate commercial or institutional business can now access at very low cost multi-bank platforms that in one screen give you every single bank on the streets price and every single bank on the streets product. Why do you need to go down the single bank portal anymore? And the answer is we don't. These aren't retail consumers voting with their feet and going through mortgages. These are institutional and corporate consumers who are also leaving the bank-branded, sticky distribution network. On the institutional side, these, these stats are old, and I can say that I think most of us might have seen this or known this, that Alipay, uh, Bao, the Bao, uh fund, $165 billion US dollars cash under management. They started raising that in 2013, 2014. It's now the biggest money managed fund in the world. They've done that in three years. 150 million plus customers. What do we think that cash is being used for? Is it to consolidate their base in China? <laughs> we don't know, but we can be sure that Southeast Asia is going to be participating in that story in some way, shape, or form. That growth, the names that, and I know you can't see them, and I apologise for that, but the names that this red line of growth that Alipay uh, is competing against are Vanguard, Fidelity, and JP Morgan. 
This isn't Alipay against Google and Facebook. They're taking on the incumbents, the heavyweights, and they're beating them, smashing them. Smaller balances, more customers, and they're able to do it in a scaled fashion. So I've talked about traditional banking. It's already happened in the mortgage market. In the foreign exchange, in the institutional market, it's already happened. Market share has been lost. I've talked about disruptive incidents like Alipay being able to raise funds with the speed that they've been able to do it. And the, one of the reasons for that speed is the way that they do things. And this for me, when I talked about that cultural challenge at the start, this is the biggest challenge that banks are facing. I want to use a bit of an example and paint a picture here. We've got Google, Amazon and Netflix. Now this is less about product and this is more about the way a bank does things. This is a real example on the, on the far right. We've got companies with extremely large revenue. We've got companies with extremely large and complex customer, uh, sorry, staff sizes across multiple jurisdictions. So there's no, it's easier for a tech firm because they're all in the one spot. It absolutely is not. In the last year, the annual releases, so these are the annual releases and upgrades, enhancement, defect changes, etc. Infra production for Amazon was around, depending on which source you're going by, about 50 to 60 million releases into production in a year. For this global bank, it was around 2,000. When you consider that Netflix runs on AWS, Amazon are able to release into production that amount and their platform is able to allow one of their customers, for want of a better term, to release into production with that amount as well against a bank that is doing releases in the thousands. How can any bank keep up with that threat, with that expectation of change? Customers expect banks to operate like utility firms now. And why shouldn't we? We should expect to pick up our phone, press a button, and money goes from A to B. And we, sh we shouldn't be charged a fee for that. It's the same as going home and switching on the lights. The lights come on, you flick a switch, the lights go off. Banking is like that. But if you're only able in your culture, in your structure, to release into production a, fraction, a minor fraction of what your new competitors are able to do, how are you going to keep up? And the pushback that I sometimes used to hear, and thankfully this is changing, but the pushback was, it's too complex. Banking's too complex. We're regulated, you see? We're regulated, so we can't do that. Uh, are, are we seriously saying that Google is not complex? That Amazon doesn't have to think about regulatory requirements? No, absolutely not. So that excuse doesn't stand up under questioning. Banks need to find a better way to innovate because the customer demands it. So the threats are many and varied. The threats are external and they are internal. But there are opportunities. I don't want to paint a totally negative picture for banks here because I've described that the bank still exists from a funding perspective. Banks still have huge distribution reach. I think at last count here in the Philippines alone, 600, around 630 global, regional, domestic and rural banks. That, that is a major industry employing a huge amount of very smart, very committed people. Banks have great human capital, people who are totally committed to improving things, making better products, delighting their customers. You can work with that. One advantage that the banks have is around this regulatory threat. Banks have developed, due to GFC, pre-GFC, Asian financial crisis, etc. banks have de developed regulatory frameworks that enable them to actually manage regulatory change, comply with regulatory change, and do that in a fashion where I think, although maybe not as efficient as it could be right now, with a bit of smarts and partnerships, with, be with more technologists around the problem, they'll be able to scale and replicate and, and utilise these kinds of challenges. 
So we're, I'm sure most of us are familiar with Waterfall as a, a, a development or a project management and development and release tool. Uh, again, the pers my personal belief and what we see in the market is there's still a place for Waterfall and sometimes Waterfall is necessary. But the key word here is embrace that I use. There needs within banks to be recognition and embrace of better and other ways of delivering. And embrace is a key word because you'll see in global press and increasingly in the regional press, more and more banks t and insurers and asset managers talking about we're going agile. We are going to adopt agile and we're going to do things better and faster. Sounds good. But the challenge and the journey that banks embark on when they say, we are adopting Agile, well, you're not adopting anything. You need to transform to Agile. And that can be very, very scary to banks. Flexibility, continuous improvement, flattening hierarchies. I don't think you need to get rid of hierarchies, but you do need to look at, banks need to look at flattening hierarchies. And decision empowerment across all all business lines, and I'm including technology as a business line. As I said, 14 years ago I started in banking, we had an IT department, and you called them when there was an IT problem. Or you called them when you needed an IT change. No, 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 not anymore. IT is at the top table. If you don't have a technologist or someone with a technology background as your COO or CEO now, you'd better hope that you are on the journey to have that individual promoted to that top table in the next few years. Banks need more technologists. Such thing as the IT department anymore in a bank is what essentially I'm saying. Conway's law, organisations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these systems. If we operate everything in a hierarchical, siloed fashion, guess what? We're going to get hierarchical, siloed systems. Banks need to change this, and thankfully the majority of them are. It's just a huge cultural journey when you're talking about rooms full of a couple of, uh, not rooms, when you're talking about organisations full of a couple of hundred thousand people across many, many geographies. I love the word monolith when it comes to banks. It's so descriptive and it's so true. These are these huge beasts, immovable somehow. But if we build small teams around the monolith, if we build small groups who are empowered to make decisions and we flatten them out, maybe have a chance to start catching up. Just indulge me there, we've all seen these. <laughs> this is what we're dealing with in, in, in banks. This would be very similar to uh, architectural systems I've seen for single asset classes within banks. Doesn't mean it's wrong or right, but it is the reality of what banks are operating on at the moment. Business models, not products, from KPMG, business models, not products, are disruptive. That's interesting. We go back to Magellan's story. As he said, factoring, Magellan didn't in invent that. That's been around for a long time. He's just found a better way. He's found a quicker way, and he's found a way that is developed with the customer at the center of everything he does. So his product is not disruptive. I'm sure parts of it are. The product existed, it exists. His business model of getting it to people, well, that is what disrupt is disruptive about this. And that is the challenge that's been thrown down to banks. So how do you get your cultural structure aligned within the bank to be able to deliver this? How do you do it in a way that is more like the SPI Globals? How do you do it m more like a technology firm? Transformation to an agile workforce is where my firm personally, we spend a lot of our time. We've built practices globally around supporting banks as they go through this agile transformation. That doesn't mean everything has to be done in an agile manner and everyone has to be an agile evangelist or a scrum master, no. It's about recognizing that there are other and potentially better ways of doing things because 
it is a better way of working and a better way of thinking and it is something great to actually aspire to, being agile. It's a great word, agile. It just sounds positive. But this is scary territory for banks and it's very scary territory for hi hierarchical bankers and bureau bureaucracies within banks because it changes career paths and it changes the way people need to operate. What we've said, what I've said is this relationship between business, the operations, the technology side, that needs to flatten out. Silos need to be pushed over because the only way to get your product enhanced and more quickly, the only way you're actually going to be able to partner with a fintech if you're a banker, is by starting to think and operate and act like them in the development. But there's one massive reason why this is important. A bigger, bigger threat out here, and it's about the workforce. Who's going to run your bank for you in the next five to ten years? Who's going to make all these changes? Who's coming through to staff these things? Who is going to be your coder, your developer? I showed you that slide with the bank with 200,000 staff on it. In five to ten years, what is going to be the predominant, predominant employee? What do they look like? Chances are the majority will be Gen Y millennial and increasingly millennial, digital native, whatever you want to call. Transparent, transparency is huge. Our lives are on social media. Uh, anyone I work with, what do you do when you take a phone call from someone that you're working with? If you're me, Google, name, okay, yep, nice to meet you. What can I find out about you on the screen while I'm talking to you? Aware, highly aware, might not communicate the way we expect an aware person to communicate, but highly aware. Collaborative, absolutely. Wants to work in a team environment, that's a generalisation, not everyone does, but wants to collaborate on projects, work with each other, improve things, wants to challenge. <laughs> <laughs> We're, I'm sure most of us here are line managers or managers or employers. I'm Gen Y, so I can say it. We're a challenging generation. We kind of like to talk back. We like to form opinions. We like to be part of the decision-making process. We want to solve problems and generally relationship-centric. That's, again, a generalisation, I think. But... Banks need to find a way to harness this future workforce to stave off the threat, to stave off the challenge. These are pretty seismic challenges, but I don't think the change is actually that seismic. The, the change just requires commitment. Because ultimately, as a workforce and as, a, uh, as an industry, banks are still dealing with consumers who, while expectations have changed, Things are kind of still similar. People are still aspirational. People are still interested. They're just consuming and buying and transacting in a very different way. I'm going to leave it there. Uh, thanks, Richard. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you all very much for uh, having me today. Cheers.